We've all experienced being sick, and I think most of us would agree it's not very fun. Outbreaks of infectious diseases like SARS, Ebola, and bird flu remind us how certain viruses are able to spread very quickly and have the potential to make a lot of people extremely sick. So what happens when sickness goes beyond being an inconvenience and becomes a global health problem? To learn more about the problem, I decided to speak to several biomedical experts. Dr. Jonathan Lee and Dr. Daniel Karitskis are researchers at Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston. They work alongside engineers to discover new ways to combat dangerous diseases caused by viruses. Diseases these days caused by various infections, including viruses, cause millions of deaths around the world. Cause uh, disease both in developing countries and in developed countries like the U.S. Our ability to travel the globe uh, with air flight, with uh, public transportation, with the fact that people are living in very dense environments these days, infections are really much more readily able to spread globally than they have ever been able to in the past. Dr. Lee told me about how small outbreaks of diseases can quickly grow into much larger problems. An epidemic is generally a large outbreak of infection that is way above what you might expect on a normal basis. And then a pandemic takes that even further, spreading worldwide. So what causes these outbreaks of disease? Turns out, people get sick when tiny microorganisms called pathogens invade the body and cause an infection. Pathogens can be things like bacteria, viruses, or parasites. I asked Dr. Lee how viruses in particular are able to spread from one person to another. Different viruses spread by different ways. Some viruses can spread through the air. Some viruses only spread through uh, contact. Viruses are the simplest form of life. Some people would even say they're not really alive because all they are are some genes, some DNA or RNA, some proteins that surround and protect those genes, and then a coat around that that has the key that lets the virus get into a particular kind of cell. Viruses have to get inside the cells in a person, and they do that by a kind of lock and key mechanism where on the outside of the virus, the coat protein is the key that lets it bind to the lock and get into the cell. And once the virus gets into the cell, it hijacks the cells to make copy after copy after copy of itself until all the new viruses explode out of the cell and go on to infect even more cells. All of this sounded really bad for a patient infected with the virus, so I decided to talk to Dr. Nirma Bustamante, who is an emergency medicine resident at Massachusetts General Hospital and Brigham and Women's Hospital. It's her job to care for sick and injured patients who come into the ER. This means that she's on the first line of defense against outbreaks of serious illnesses. So emergency medicine is a specialty in which doctors are trained to deal with all emergencies. So we're basically the gateway or the entry to the hospital. And what would you do if you were working um, and someone came in with something that you've never seen before, with a virus that you know was a new strain or something like that? But it's something that we've never seen before. The first thing we do is to make sure we isolate them. Because if we don't know what's going on, we don't know what we're dealing with, and we don't know how fast it can spread. Dr. Bustamante showed me on a training mannequin how she would diagnose and treat a patient that comes into the ER with a possible viral infection. I check the patient from top to bottom. I then can run tests to check to see what kind of infection the patient can have. One of the things that we do is that we take blood samples to check not only to see how they're doing, but to try to figure out what kind of infection they have in their body. So we take the blood sample, we send it to the laboratory, and then they can either use machines, special equipment, or microscopes to see if there's an infection in that blood sample. Dr. Bustamante's checks are definitely thorough. In order to treat a patient with a viral infection, she needs to administer a medicine called an antiviral. Antivirals are special drugs that are designed by biomedical experts to block viruses from spreading to new cells within the body. Back at the research lab, Dr. Lee and Dr. Karitskis are working to find a solution that can be engineered into an antiviral that Dr. Bustamante can give to her patients. They use something called the engineering design process, which is a tool that engineers use to help them solve problems. The first step is identifying the problem. People are getting sick from a specific type of virus. Then, they investigate the virus and any similar viruses that biomedical engineers 
designed antivirals for in the past. They'll then imagine solutions and plan the antiviral designs carefully before creating them and testing them on samples in the lab. Here in this lab, we test antiviral drugs to see how they work against viruses to stop them from growing in cells with the hope that we can then put them into people to be able to treat infections that are caused by viruses. Remember how Dr. Karitskis talked about how a virus has a key that's able to get inside of a cell that's locked? What we'll show you in the lab is how we're testing antiviral compounds that are really gumming up the lock and preventing the key from getting into that lock. Because we need to understand what are the different parts of the virus and how do they work together so we know what parts we can try to block. To see this process in action, I had Dr. Lee take me into the lab. This is where we work with actual live viruses. Most of the reason we work in this kind of laboratory is to make sure that splashes and fluids that contain the virus don't get on our skin, get in our eyes, or uh, on our clothes. And that's the reason to be so careful in, in how we're working. So it's an extra level of safety. Exactly. That's right. Dr. Lee introduced me to Hayat, who is the researcher in charge of growing viruses, infecting cells, and testing potential formulations of antivirals. Hayat showed me how they grow human cells and viruses for their research. So what we have here is um, basically food for the cells, because uh, they need nutrients to grow and thrive. But so why would you want to grow viruses? Aren't viruses bad? We want to learn how they work within the body, mm. and uh, we want to be able to simulate that as best as we can. So, can you show me what a virus looks like? Well, it's very difficult to see the actual virus, but what you can see is cells that are infected with the virus. Hayat showed me how the infected cells showed up fluorescent under her microscope. So once you see that there are these infected cells, what would be the next step after that? So after that, we would try to use different concentrations of the, the antiretrovirals, try to see different formulations to, to target those infected cells. We do a lot of repetitions just to, to make sure that what we're seeing is, is real. The team uses the test step of the engineering design process in this part of their research. They continue to test potential antiviral formulations, looking for a solution that prevents the virus from spreading to new cells. So after you do all this testing, what are the next steps to develop an antiviral? Hayat was taking all these viruses and cells and testing them with the different molecules or compounds that might work against the virus to stop it from growing. These are all slightly different from each other, and we want to find out which is the most effective against the virus, because that's the one that we want to then develop into a drug, so that we can make sure it is going to be uh, able to be uh, administered or given to a patient, and that it's going to be safe to give to a patient. The researchers work closely with engineers, who apply the research and create a medicine that stops the virus. But what happens when viruses change their shape after an antiviral has been developed? That's when researchers and engineers need to work together to improve their original designs. Viruses are, are constantly changing. And they can do something called mutate their DNA, where they can actually change their DNA to make different types of protein, change their proteins. When the virus mutates, what it can do is cause resistance to this antiviral, such that maybe it can use a different lock instead of the one that we're originally targeting. So we constantly need to develop new antivirals for the viruses out there, as well as new um, uh, antiviral drugs for the viruses that we don't have any treatment for. This is where the team uses the improved step of the engineering design process. And because viruses are always changing, the engineering never stops. This also means that they have to communicate with other biomedical professionals in order to stop the virus from spreading. Engineers have to continue going through the design process to create new antivirals that address a virus threat that is constantly changing. It's pretty amazing to think about all of the people involved in helping to stop the spread of viruses. Now that I know how quickly viruses can mutate and spread from one area of the world to another, I'm even happier to know that there are teams of doctors and biomedical engineers stopping viruses in their tracks. But at the rate that viruses can mutate and change, who knows, maybe you'll be the biomedical engineer that comes up with the ultimate antiviral to stop them all.
Tchau!